Holmes turned off on silent just to not have any disturbances during the debate. Um, so the running order for tonight is going to be each of the speakers will have 15 minutes to present their opening arguments, after which there'll be a 15 minute rejoinder where they'll both have the opportunity to ask questions to each other um, and then answer. We ask in that time that the audience doesn't interject, there'll be opportunities later on. That'll be followed by a quick break with um, opportunities for Nate Burst Matter and all the stakeholders to introduce themselves to you so you understand who's put the event on. And then there'll be the sort of half an hour or so period where the audience can ask their questions or make their points and be responded to by the, uh, the speakers. Uh, so we've got our two speakers. Alan has just uh, walked off. On our left, uh, arguing in favour of PR, he lives in Sheffield. He is a retired investigative journalist and a reader in intellectual property at the University of Kent. He's co-founder of the group Get PR Done, which was founded in January of 2020, and uh, he's a retired academic and an activist, so this is something that he you know, cares deeply about and knows quite a lot about. And then on my right here is uh, David Denver, formerly Professor of Political Science at Lancaster University. He's an expert in elections, he's written a book on elections, and he, he's a local living in Lancaster as well. We'll be arguing against the motion uh, that PR is an urgent priority. So, not to drag it out too much longer, if you're ready to give your opening statement. Sure. Okay. Okay, thanks for the introduction, sorry, Nick right there, Josh. Uh, it's good to be in Lancaster, and this is for the first time in my life in Lancaster. Um, when, and not if, we get proportional representation in this country, I wish it was last week, and sometime writes the history of how we got there, Lancaster will be more than a footnote. In July 2022, Lancaster City Council was one of the first councils in England to pass the Councils for PR motion, calling for PR to be introduced at Westminster elections. And I read this article yesterday from the Lancaster Guardian that said this motion was proposed by a Green councillor, but it was seconded by councillors from the Greens, Labour, and the Lib Dems. That's the spirit that we are trying to build in the pro-PR movement. Non-sectarian for the interests of voters. Now the same motion was passed last week in Sheffield, where I live. Sadly, the local Labour councillors voted against the very same C C4 PR motion. They didn't seem to recognize that the Labour Party changed its policy on PR at its September 2022 conference, more than 100 years late, and that to oppose PR, as they did in Sheffield, was so against their own party's policy. And we can get PR done, salute the great work done this past summer by local electoral reformers in Make Votes Matter, who recreated the suffragettes' long march of 100 years ago. The Get PR Done distribution team are the recognized kings of PR a pro-PR social media agitation, I'm sorry, I mean education, <laughs> and we gave extensive publicity to this terrific media coverage that you received. I'll come back to Lancaster again in a few minutes. So in this debate, the motion up for discussion is this. This House believes the introduction of proportional representation for general elections should be a high priority for the next government. I speak in favor of this motion. And I speak in favor for one main reason. We simply cannot go on any longer with the anarchic, undemocratic, and downright duplicitous first past the post voting system that's plagued this country for a long, long time. Now perhaps first past the post worked fine in the 1880s when landowning aristocrats dominated parliament and voting was restricted to property owning men. It doesn't work now. It's broke. We need a total top to bottom major overhaul of the whole voting system. 
Now, too often, the voting system is a subject thought to be only for nerds and geeks, or talked about purely as a matter of statistics. Now, I may mention a few statistics, you have to do that a little bit, but I want to talk about values, morality, fairness, how we want to live our lives, and how we want our country to be run. In other words, I want to go back some basic principles, and I'm going to make four points. Now, I'm trying to take a slight tangent, I used to be a university teacher. I want to make sure sort of the class, always at least on one level, we understand the basics of the two systems. Now, first past the post is called a single member plurality system, as I'm sure David knows well. The candidate who gets more votes than any of the other candidates over a relatively small terrain or district is declared the winning candidate. It is a winner-takes-all system. 200 or 300 second-place finishes gets a party zilch. It's winner wins everything. Now, there's no certain correlation between votes cast and seats won. A party can form a majority government, which gives it 100% of the power, on a mere 33% of the overall vote. Boris Johnson got 43, but Tony Blair got 35 in 2005. In Canada, they're even going lower than that. Now, by comparison, proportional representation is based on three cardinal rules or laws. First, all votes are equal. All votes matter. And C, party seats won in the parliament should match votes cast. A party getting 10% of the overall vote should get 10% of the seats. And in the developed capitalist democracies, almost all of the countries, with the exception of the UK, the US, and Canada, where I was born, tend to use proportional representation and have swept first past the post into the dustbin of history. Now, France does not, and there's just some little combinations here and there, but First past the post is definitely not the leading system in the world. So, let's first ask this question. Why do we have elections? What is their purpose? What are the most important interests that should determine what kind of a voting system we have? I want to argue here that we often look at elections through a completely faulty lens, which is we often fail to recognize that interests are served by elections, and that the real interest, the public interest, is almost invisible. Now, when it comes to the chances of electoral reform, the most prominent voices we hear are from political parties, and from the big two, the Tories and Labour in particular. Now, in the year 2022, we heard their voices a lot. Fearing that a Labour government might act first past the post, Tory election planners said, and here I'm quoting from the Daily Mail of the 27th of August 2022, that changing the voting system, quote, might lock the Conservatives out of power for a generation. A month later, on the eve of his own party's conference, Labour leader Keir Stammer told The Guardian, the electoral reform was not a priority for him. As already mentioned, changing the voting system was a priority for the members of his own party. But that particular contradiction we can leave for another day. And what these backroom Tory, you know, the backroom boys and Stammer are expressing is what we could call is the partisan view of elections. They are concerned that whether or not a particular voting system will further their own interests. What's in it for me? What's this voting system? It's good, good for good for our party or not good for our party. However, elections are not partisan events. They are events that are thoroughly infused with an overwhelming public interest. They are events, or are supposed to be events, that serve the interests of voters that give us as voters 
a chance to give our input into the policies of our country and the political process gives us a chance to decide who should control our government. Now, as we will discuss in a few minutes, there's no question that First Past the Post has served both the labor interests in the past and Tory interests in the past 13 years. But their narrow partisan interests are often in conflict with the interests of voters. We should be in favor of what we may call the democracy interest in elections. Canadian political scientist Dennis Pilon, that's P-I-L-O-N, has written on this subject, and I commend his work to you. Just Google it, Dennis. He's great. He's, I think it's not just because he's a Canadian, I can assure you, but um, that he really is like the leading theorist on the value of PR. Uh, we as electoral reformers should make the interests, our interests, the same as the interests of voters, and that's all we should be concerned about. Hence, it is in the interests of voters to enforce a system where, A, all votes are equal, all votes matter, and seats won in a parliament should match votes votes cast. I mean, why, for example, should the vote of two geographically separate voters be dramatically less or more powerful depending on where they live? First past the post operates as a postcode lottery. I just don't understand how a Democrat can defend it. Okay, the second point I want to make now. How come only two parties in the UK have ever won elections or finished second in the past 100 years. It's the same in the United States. No other party other than the Democrats or Republicans have ever won since, wait for it, 1848. Is it any surprise that so many people feel alienated and so powerless in our broken political culture? I mean, how many people would follow the top division of football if only one or two teams, say Liverpool and Manchester United, always won the league. Like, it's a, it's a duopoly. Only two teams can win. Or would we, what happens if only two countries, say Brazil or Germany, always won the World Cup? Football fans would probably say, this is a crooked game. It's fixed. Well, let's get back to elections. It's a situation where lots of voters have come to the same conclusion. Now, as an article in The Independent made clear this week, quote, almost two in three voters want a new political party to take on the Conservatives and Labour, adding that a poll measuring trust found that Brits are overwhelmingly pessimistic, distrustful of government, and disdainful of politicians. So, why does one of the two big two always win in these three countries, in Canada, the US, and the UK? Is it because they're just better and smarter? Or because their policies are endorsed by most people? Or is it just a coincidence? It's none of these reasons, explained uh, French political scientist Maurice Delbergier in papers he wrote during the 1950s and 1960s. After a detailed study of voting patterns across the world, the Verge concluded, and here I quote, that the surest way to produce a two-party system was to create a first-past-the-post winner-takes-all voting system based on single-member constituency or districts. This two-party privilege arises from the very structure of the particular electoral system. The result is all but preordained. Now, I'm sure we all appreciate the dangers of monopoly. The dangers of a duopoly are not much different. Duopoly creates an electoral dictatorship and a political culture that is stale and elitist and totally unrepresentative of UK voters. I mean, how could a modern liberal country like the UK is have a home secretary who says her fondest wish in the world is to deport to Rwanda refugees fill it, feeling, sorry, fleeing the killing fields in Syria or Afghanistan. I mean, it's really shocking that, that Suella Braverman is the Home Secretary. Now third, 
first past the post means millions of wasted votes and millions of voters with, quite frankly, a hope in hell, without a hope in hell, of influencing the result of a general election. Let's go across the political spectrum and see how first past the post is, quite bluntly, a downright flop for a functioning democracy. It's a vote of lost voices. Now here, I need to get to a few statistics. On first, on the right, in the 2015 general election, there were 3.8 million voters for UKIP. That total, an amazing 12.6% of the overall total. And how many MPs got elected by UKIP? One. Enough said. Except to say they got their revenge in 2016 when all the votes were equal. Now let's look for the Tories. It seems safe to predict that a number of Tory MPs may lose their seats in the next general election. I have to admit, it's not an idea that fills me with dread, but it's likely to happen. But the votes, let's admit, of Tory voters should be the same as the votes of other parties, voters for other parties. But first past the post opposes this idea completely. Yes, in some regions, Tory voters are currently far overrepresented. In Staffordshire, for example, the Tories took all 12 seats in 2019 on only 6% of the votes, 100% of the power on 6% of the votes. But now conversely in South Yorkshire, in 2017, I live in South Yorkshire, Labour swept all 14 seats in South Yorkshire, even though the Tories got 30% of the overall vote. You know, I, I moved there a few years ago. I thought this is all tar this really labor country. It's not labor country. Other parties have quite a lot of following. Now let's now move to the Lib Dems. And let's look at the 1983 general election. It was the first serious challenge to the two-party duopoly. Labor finished second to Margaret Thatcher and the Tories. Labor got 27.6% of the total vote and 209 seats. The alliance, made up of the Liberals and the Social Democrats, this is before the Lib Dems were created, were just behind at 25.4% of the vote. You know, Labour got 27.6, the alliance got 25.4%, but they were very far behind in seats. They got a mere 23 seats compared to Labour's 209. I mean, who can justify a system like that? And we could then go on about the Lib Dems in the most recent election. You know, their vote total went up and their seats went down. I mean, it's just like ridiculous. Let's next move to green voters. Some green voters are very hopeful they will pick up more MPs in the next general election. Green voters should study carefully what happened to UKIP voters in 2015. Even if green votes went up fivefold in the next general election, that is from 850,000 to 4 million, Carolyn Lucas might still be the only green MP. Like how can you justify a system which is so unfair like that? Now, labor voters, our next group, in many parts of the country, labor voters have a limited chance of electing labor MPs. It's like the Tories some places. But it is no surprise, for example, that the pro-PR movement in the Labour Party is strongest in the Southwest, which is an area which is very hard for Labour to make traction. Now, last group, with Keir Stammer moving his party more and more rightward <coughs> week by week, and with Labour Party membership down an estimated 200,000, there's a sizable segment of voters who are now to the left of labor. Who do they vote for? Some are calling for the creation of a new party of the labor of the left. I can appreciate the attraction. Who knows, I might join myself. But until we have PR in this country, it will be a losing proposition electorally. And its chances of electing an MP are chancy at best. I mean, compare this with Finland, 
My son lives in Finland. I've studied that for a lot in the voting system. There's a party called the Left Alliance. In the 2019 election in, in Finland, they got 8% of the votes. Like they're like left of the Labour Party, the Finnish Social Democrats. So they got 8% of the votes. As a result, a left alliance are represented by 8% of the seats in the Finnish legislature. That's how PR works. And it doesn't work in this country. And across the country, I'll well, sort of ending the statistics. I see people's eyes blazing over. <laughs> across the country, a staggering total of 190 seats, 92 seats, have not switched parties since the end of World War II. 192 of 600, it's still the same old thing. They're just safe seats everywhere. Uh, it's just like, who can justify this? And do we really wonder why so many people see no point in voting and are so contemptuous of our political system? Surely I don't need to bring up more football analogies. It's just like, finished. Okay, I hope it's finished. The first and last point is the following. First past the post often gives many, us, many of us but one choice, tactical voting. Tactical voting. But it's in fact no choice. Yes, tactical voting may be needed in the next election to turf out several coach loads of Tories MPs. That's the strategy of the Compass Group and Get PR Done is supporting this campaign. But other than that, uh, exception. I think tactical voting is a deeply flawed and deeply undemocratic way to cast your vote and is directly the result of first past the post. I mean, why can't we vote for whom we want to? Is that some kind of subversive? Like, I can vote for party X, I want, oh, but it's not going to mean anything, so I have to tactically vote. Why should we have to vote for a second choice? Now, I'm age 75. I'm single, and I've been on a few dating sites for the past couple of months. I try to find a woman I will come to love, and who has the potential to love me. And I think I found her, actually, but that's for another time. <laughs> in both voting and in relationships, why should I have to pick my second choice? <laughs> or the choice I dislike the, dislike the least? Do we really think that those who participated in the 1819 events in Peterborough in Manchester, which led to the massacre in a cavalry charge of about 10 protesters who were campaigning then for universal male suffrage, would be satisfied with tactical voting? Do you really think the suffragettes who marched a century ago, including here in Lancaster, would have been satisfied with mere Tactical voting. I mean, I can hear Emily Pankers groaning at the very idea. Now, I want to close by this. PR is not a silver bullet. Much more needs to be done to seriously reform our politics and erase the feelings of alienation and enemy felt by millions. All I'm arguing is that reforming our voting system is a good place to start. So. I've had my go. I support the motion before this house. Get PR done. Over to you, Professor Denver. Good evening. Uh, it's a very long time since I've participated in a debate. <laughs> I think actually it was when I was at school uh, because I remember actually arguing against Britain joining what was then the common market. Uh, so that even then I was committed to democracy, you see. Uh, so even although uh, in this uh, environment, uh, trying to persuade an audience uh, mostly composed of make vote matter supporters in, with posters around, leaflets on the, and a t-shirt at the back, uh, Trying to persuade you of the virtues of the single, you know, of what we will call for short first past the post is rather like trying to convince an audience that Hitler wasn't all that bad. Uh, nonetheless, thank you for getting me <laughs> along here to talk to you. Let me say straight away, I think there's much to admire about PR. 
and, and in particular the single transferable vote, STV. Uh, as you know, we now have a variety of electoral systems in this country, and, and in Scotland in particular, we have STV for local elections, and we have uh, what's called the mixed member proportional system to elect the Scottish Parliament. Uh, and this yields absolutely masses of data for geeks like me. I've spent many a happy hour uh, on my computer playing around with it. And it's also got you know, purely practical uses. For a very long time now, I've been uh, the kind of Scottish arm of a team which monitors and assesses the effects of constituency boundary changes. I've done that, would you believe, since the 1980s. Uh, and for, for a very long time, it was a real problem because we use local election data to analyse the changes. Uh, and of course, the problem is that in local elections, lots of people vote for independence, certainly in Scotland they do. Uh, and so you wonder, well, what would they do in a general election? Uh, well, now, you know, what I, I'm currently doing it for the current round of constituency boundary reviews, uh, and all I need to do is look up the preference profiles for every, you can look at them for every ward in Scotland, it shows you every, you know, the order of preference that people give. So I can see the second preference of independent voters, for example, uh, even down to the third and fourth and fifth preferences if they have them. So it's, it's, it's useful, it's interesting. Uh, and I also like the fact that under STV, voters can order their preferences amongst the, the, the candidates of the party that they support. You know, if you're a Labour supporter, you might hate Jeremy Corbyn and put a Corbyn supporter, you know, candidate at the bottom. Or you might just prefer to vote for a local person, so you put the local person, and that happens in Ireland a lot. Uh, it's called so-called friends and neighbours uh, effect. Uh, or you might want a woman to be elected, so you could put a woman first and you know, the others second. So that's all to the good. You're not just stuck with the choice of the local party, uh, or even these days more often, well not more often, these days quite frequently somebody imposed from the party headquarters. So I like all that. However, there is a downside, and that's what I call alphabetical voting. Uh, people actually, when they come to vote in an STV election, tend to go one, two, three. In that order, the order that the candidates appear in, and of course they appear alphabetically. Now there's absolutely no question whatsoever that this happens. I mean, it's incontestable. I'll give you a couple of examples just to, to lighten the evening. Uh, in the 2017 Scottish local election, in wards where uh, Labour and the SNP had two candidates but won one seat, the higher placed person was elected in 90% of Labour cases and in 82% of SNP cases. And just to get more recent and just up the road, in 2022 in Dumfries and Galloway, where there were two Conservative candidates, uh, the top Conservatives together got seven, sorry, 12,400 votes and the lower place Conservatives got 7,300 votes in total. So, you know, of course somebody might say you can randomise names, but actually that doesn't happen in, in very, I think only in one or two places around the world, and it would be expensive, and there's absolutely no prospect of it happening in, in this country. And so this adoption of a, a system like that would be very bad news, for example, for Kat Smith, uh, MP in Lancaster, if she found herself in a list with Labour candidates called Adams and Brown. In that case, she would lose. And I understand she actually supports PR. Maybe she's not thought it through like that. Another downside concerns the number of invalid or rejected votes. This is very much larger under PR and under first past the post. Now, a notable case which some of you might remember was the Scottish Parliament election of 2007, when 85,000 constituency ballots were rejected. That was 4.1% of the total, incorrectly filled in. In the London Assembly elections in, nine, in 2000, again, that's uh, London also has a mixed member proportional system, no less than 9.3% of constituency ballots and 5% of list ballots were rejected. 
Now, that kind of level of spoiled votes or invalid votes is simply inconceivable under first-past-the-post. I won't bother you with the statistical details. Now, this reflects, I think, the complicated choices that need to be made. PR systems attract many more fringe parties and groups because they don't need that many candidates to get onto the list or you only need one to go into an ST, STD election where you might need four to, to do it. You know, it's four different wards. Uh, and, and, and so you get these long lists of rather odd groups. In uh, just a couple of examples, in London in 2016, there were 12 parties on the list ranging alphabetically from the Animal Welfare Party to the Women's Equality Party. And even worse, in Glasgow and Lothian in 2007, in those regions, the list uh, that, that the voters faced believe it or not, contained 20, 23, in both cases, 23 parties and or individuals were on the list. And no wonder the people got confused. Now contrast this with the simplicity of first past the post. And first past the post not only tends to reduce the number of fringe parties standing, but it reduces the chances of extreme parties being elected. I mean, I kind of rather recoiled in horror when Alan mentioned this obviously nutcase left party getting 8% of the seats in Finland. It would never happen under first past the post. Whereas, of course, as we know, uh, the BNP managed to win some seats under PR, even in this area. This area was represented by the leader of the BNP in the European Parliament, you might remember. I don't know what's happened to him. He's disappeared off the face of the earth, as far as I can make out. But enough of these little kind of twos and twos and pros of, 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 of interesting details. I, too, want to make four general points. We must ask ourselves, what, are, what should an electoral system be designed to achieve? And I can think of four plausible answers. The first is, and this is one that you'll cheer at, I guess, it's to enable the representation of voters' opinion in rough proportion to their strength in the electorate, as was amply demonstrated in the previous uh, speech. If you, know, you get 8% of the votes, you should get 8% of the seats. A second possibility is to allow for the representation of geographically defined areas. You know, different parts of the country should be represented somehow. The third, however, is to decisively confer power on a team of leaders or a party, to confer power decisively, and therefore, fourthly, to enable the electorate to hold a government accountable and replace it. Now, no system can do all of those at once. And ultimately, ultimately, a preference for one over another, I think, uh, really comes down to making a value judgment about which of these purposes should be given greatest priority. Obviously, Alan and most people here think the first should be given greatest priority to enable the representation of blah, blah. I don't. I think that the last, and the last two, but the last in particular, uh, is what really matters. PR almost inevitably would give rise to coalitions in this country. Now, and that happens all around the world. And these coalitions are formed by politicians haggling behind closed doors. That's what decides who becomes the government. Not the election, but the politicians making deals. And an example that's current at the moment is, of course, in Ireland. I don't know if you know, but in Ireland, the two main parties, Fine Gael and Fianna Foyle, fought one another for years, fought each other in a civil war, actually. Uh, but they currently form a coalition in the Irish Parliament. 
uh, and a sharing government after a deal done behind closed doors, although the folk on the ground hate each other. Moreover, in these circumstances, small parties get influence far, far beyond what uh, their popularity among voters would suggest. And here we need to look no further than Scotland, where in the Scottish Parliament, which has been in the news a great deal recently, of course, uh, the Greens in 2021, the last Scottish Parliament election, got 7.6% of list votes, that's all, 7.6%, <coughs> and 1.3% of constituency votes. But, if you lived in Scotland, you would know that the Greens are now able to enforce the policies, which some people consider absolutely nutty, such as not repairing roads, not improving roads, allowing the A9 which goes right up the north of Scotland to, to become jammed and make no attempt to improve it, and never mind what they say about gas and oil. Uh, they're able to enforce those policies on everybody with 7.6% of list votes. Now, of course, first past the post occasionally in, it, it produces an indecisive result, and we've seen that uh, in 2010 in this country and in 2017. Uh, however, that is rare. That's something that it's, it's so uh, kind of dramatic because it's so rare. If we had PR, it would happen all the time. All the time. Single party government makes it easy for voters to know who to praise or, more usually, who to blame and then to throw the rascals out. That's what First Past the Post enables. That seems to me to be a vital element of democracy, and it's why I oppose any change in the electoral system towards PR. Thank you. So I'm going to quickly move myself. Okay, so now we're going to have a little rough and tumble here. And a little debate. Um, right. As, as you just spoke, David, I'll, I'll let you have the first question. Fallon. Absolutely. <laughs> but you've got a question for Yeah, I do have a question. First, yeah. How do you justify... I mean, I really don't like to sort of... I know the left alliance. Uh, calling parties with 8% of the vote nutcases. I mean, I find that like quite outrageous. Do you? Eight, eight, well, okay. You, you may think 8% of the Finnish people... What would you say if 8% of them voted for fascists? Well, no, no, just a sec. Fascists are different. Ah. No, well, I do think a legal party should, in fact, their vote should count. And, and UKIP, for example, they should have got a lot more from their 13%. Because what people who support First Past the Post do to far-right parties will screw them up by the wacky mass of first past the post. We don't give them any seats. And, and did that work well? Well, look what those people are now infiltrated the Tory party, but big time. You don't defend, you don't like, if you want to, uh, right wing ideas should be challenged, I'm, I'm a lefty, by ca campaigning against their ideas, not by trickery. Like, you only got one MP, so you see, they got 13% of the vote. The people who are UKIP got really angry that they just feel completely ignored. They didn't get ignored the next year when they voted for Brexit. Um, so how many, you, you didn't, didn't really address the current situation in this country. Uh, let's see, Boris Johnson, uh, Liz Truss, uh, Rishi Sunak, this is what is produced Right now, you didn't talk very much at all about the national government. You talked about, you know, all these sort of little examples. What about the national government in this country? What about it? I mean, what well, about it? I, okay, I mean, you I mean, may think, I mean, I, for example, our group. I mean, I think that, the, you know, we have, we have two parties which are, broadly speaking, in the middle now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, well, 
Yeah, bro, there's not much difference between yeah. Rishi Sunak and Keir Starman. I, I think you're quite yeah. right. Yeah. But both Marxist... neoliberal and on the right, yeah. But Marxist... They're both neoliberal and on the right because they're influenced by the hegemony. Yeah. Wait, 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 I agree with you. I don't think, but some people, for example, hundreds of thousands of people are completely opposed to what Rishi Sunak's doing and the way Keir Stammer is doing to the Labour Party. I mean, our group has a campaign, fair pay, fair voting. It's no surprise that this government is telling teachers, firefighters, except 4%, no, no, yeah. the cost of living is 10%. What actually has this got to do with the electoral system? It's got a lot to do with a, a group who run the Tory party, who got an 80 seat majority and sit up there, work talk of the walk and too bad for you. It creates these big monoliths, far over represented. Uh, you know, like it caught the Greens, for example, it took 850,000 votes to elect one MP. The Tories, get 25,000, or sorry, 30,000 votes, get your Tory MP. How can that be justified? Well, because, well, I mean, what you're doing all the time is taking the national vote and saying, you know, like the Greens. And, the Brit a British general election consists of 650 separate contests. <laughs> That's what it's about. And people in a constituency understand how you know, they, they realise and understand how the system works. Uh, 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 and, and it's clear and it's simple, you know, and you only make an X and it, you know, that's it. You don't then aggregate it all up and say, oh, it's unfair. It's because there are separate contests. Uh, you think that the separate contests, yeah. that people vote for their local candidate? Come on, David. People vote by parties. Labour voters vote for a Labour a labor candidate. The role of these local candidates, I, I thought you'd bring up this about the local candidate. Most people mm. vote for their parties. They, cer they certainly do, but, but they are voting for their party in a local context. So what's that mean? That? <laughs> what that? Well, it's a, it's a contest within a, within a constituency. And people understand how, how it works. And they understand how it, you know, the winner gets chosen. To, to, to then, and, and so the result is, as I, as I said there, the result is we get a system which tends to exclude extremists, which provides a party, uh, I mean, yeah. uh, a, I, I would call extremists BNP, uh, you know, you know, I don't know, communist, I don't suppose there is a communist party, militant tendency or something like that. It tends to exclude the people like that. Uh, and. Uh, I forget what I was going to say now. Uh, and, and the result well, is we get a single party usually getting control of the government. We then can hold that, 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 that party accountable, as you're just doing, you know, with Rishi Sunak and all that stuff. Uh, and you can, at the next election, you can vote to keep them in or get, get rid of them as you please, uh, which you wouldn't be able to do with PR. You right. just wouldn't. No, no it, what would yeah. happen is, if people, for example, are opposed to Rishi Sunak, the only alternative is not Keir Stammer. That's what PR does. Yeah, I'm saying first past the post, that gives you one alternative. Yes. So, welcome back, everyone. No. Hope that was a nice little refresher. Um, it's been recharged because now it's the opportunity to ask questions, make points. It doesn't have to be directed at you, then you can just make a point about PR or first past the post, anything like that. Just ask you to keep it to a minute, ideally. Um, nothing more than a minute, otherwise, we get quite a while as everyone has a speech. It's insane. If you answer, just try to limit the amount of time spent answering, don't you know, interrupt each other during the answers. Uh, yeah, the back. Yeah, I can you speak up? Everyone was saying it's very interesting. Can you speak um, up, please? Yeah, so what, what I would like to know, um, is there any system that you think is better than first past the post? <laughs> yeah, so is there a version of something that involves some kind of proportional system that you think would be better than first past the post, or do you think first past the post is just 
No, I mean, I mean, don't, don't, don't misinterpret me. I'm not saying that the first past the post is absolutely wonderful and does everything perfectly. It doesn't. It, it doesn't, for example, do the first thing I mentioned, proportionally represent things. You know, it doesn't allow voters to to order the candidates. You know, it's got lots of flaws. But I think that the great strength, which is the one I stress, the kind of outweighs these flaws. That 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 that. But, I mean, it's a value judgment, and people have different values, and I perfectly appreciate that. Mm -hmm. But that, it just seems to me that that's of, of, of the kind of best of a bad lot, if you see what I mean. Yeah, yeah in, the, in the back. Oh. Ready? Yeah. Back, back, yeah. Me? Okay. I'm sorry. I don't know. Who... No, Speak up. Thank you. All right. Um, we, when we're talking and we're discussing how we would get a democratic fair voting system, what role does the media and financing yeah. have to play in skewing how that plays out because you can have any of these voting systems but if someone has the money and the power to manipulate in the media so you said um the other gentleman about there were 65 different votes but if we're being broadcasted to by a party that has obviously some influence i mean certainly in blackpool people weren't choosing the man you got they were choosing because the Tories had better messaging that year. So what, what power and influence does media and money have over the voting system? I think it's huge. Yeah. I disagree. All, all academic work shows that the, the power of the media is vastly exaggerated by the media itself and uh, by, you know, I've quoted the, the person in the street. Uh, what, what's found, generally speaking, is that the media are very good at reinforcing previously held attitudes. People, people are not silly fools, you know. People have opinions, people talk about politics, among other things, with friends and neighbours and, and workmates and so on and so forth. People are not fools, they're not kind of empty vessels into which the media pour uh, oil or vile stuff or whatever. Uh, but what the media tends to do is reinforce pre-existing attitudes. And that, that, I think, has been pretty well established in academic research in, in this area. Yep. Good. So, oh, oh, do you want to I just want to ask, and reply to the fellow in the white shirt at the back, um, that in Mikvo, in, in Get PR Done, we do not think the question of the hour is what type of PR system. We, in fact, think, and I, you saw, I would spend most of my time knocking down uh, uh, first past the post. To talk about what kind of PR system we should get, that is completely an abstract question. We have to win over people to see that this current system is terrible. Because I have a great fear that the PR movement, if we could be the STV PR movement, the open list PR movement. We just want one movement to get rid of this system and then have a process to replace it. Yeah, uh, two questions, if I may. Uh, so first of all, uh, David, sorry, I realize you've got a tough crowd today, but um, how would you defend an incumbent government uh, gerrymandering constituencies? And second of all, um, we've seen a move in the past decade towards uh, parties, party membership essentially electing the leadership within yeah. that party. Uh, do you think that's sort of been the downfall of um, first past the post? Uh, well, obviously, I wouldn't defend gerrymandering under any circumstances, uh, but it doesn't happen in this country. The constituency boundaries are decided by an independent boundary commission. Uh, which is comprised, comprises, I mean, I know the members of the Boundary Commission in Scotland. One of them is Professor of Politics at Edinburgh University. Uh, they are in no way uh, partisan. It's an independent Boundary Commission that does it. Now, and by contrast, as you possibly know, in the United States, it's the state governments which set the boundary, uh, the congressional boundaries and so on, and they are unashamedly partisan in doing it. But it doesn't happen in this country. They, uh, I mean, the thing about party members voting for leadership, I've, I've often said to myself, well, you know, why would people become a member of a political party if they're denied, you know, kind of even participation in choosing that party's leader? I mean, it's a kind of 
reward, if you like, for as a, as used to, as is choosing a, 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 a candidate. It's a kind of reward, and, and I, you know, I, I remember once being called upon by a chap who represented a thing called the campaign for more democracy in the Labour Party, and I said to him, that seems to me that the less democracy in the Labour Party, the better, really. Uh, but I've come around to the view that party members really ought to have a say in, in you know, how the party's run and who runs it. But I don't think it's got anything to do with first past the post, to tell the truth. Yes, sure. Just quickly, under PR, usually, you never change the boundaries. You don't have to worry about that problem. Mm -hmm. And if changing the boundaries makes complete nonsense of this idea, the sacredness of the constituency. One constituency, then next week it changes. So this idea of having to change okay. consistency, well, like every 20 years. What? Not next week, every 20 years. Well, okay, every 20 years. It, but it makes a nonsense of this idea of the sacred constituency and more importantly, we have questions like climate change. Uh, I, I'm a member, of, I, I live in Sheffield Hallam. How is climate change in Sheffield Hallam any different than climate change in Sheffield Central? This idea, you know, I mean, that, it's, that MPs are worried about garbage collecting, it, it's ridiculous. We have the, the war in Ukraine, these are big national issues. This constituency focus exclusively it is, to my idea, a nonsense. Yeah, in the yeah. Hi. Um, you've advocated, David, that First Past the Post produces single party government, mm -hmm. which it clearly does. Yeah. Um, presumably, behind that, you believe that single party government is usually good government. No, Personally, not necessarily. No. Well, I believe it's responsible in the sense of accountable. Yeah, so what would you, let's suppose that I, which I do believe that coalition government is better government. That that the first of your points, yeah. the point about the electoral system producing representation, proportional yeah. representation, yeah. is the most important, yeah. and that the responsibility for them producing yeah. a good and responsible government rests with those who are elected mm. under a PR system. Yeah. Well, notice that the word responsible here doesn't mean sensible or. So anything like that. It means accountable. Right. The problem with a coalition, as we've seen in this country actually, is when it comes to the next election, one element in the coalition will blame the other element in the coalition and say it wasn't us, it wasn't us, it was them. Uh, and you don't know who to hold accountable. That's the problem, it seems to me, with a, with a coalition. I mean, you're perfectly entitled to say you think coalitions are good. People, some, a lot of people prefer consensus rather than conflict and so on, you know. And that you're perfectly entitled to think that. And if you want that, well, that will decide how you so react. If we take system. this one step further, yeah. it's taken first past the post a hundred years to build in the electorate the habit of thinking that every election is a binary choice. There's only two parties you can vote for. It's A or B. It will take PR, in my opinion, 25, 30 years at least before the electorate understand mm. how it changes politics, how it should change the way they think about voting and how it should change the way they actually vote. Mm -hmm. that's, that's my view yep. of, of what PR is for. Yep. Yeah. Good. Can, I, can I just make a good point? A quick point about Finland again, my son lives there. There's five parties in a coalition government in Finland, all amazingly led by women, and four of the five under the age of 35. There's the Social Democratic Party, sort of like the Labour Party. There is the Green Party. There is uh, supposedly the nut cases in the left alliance. And there's two more mainstream parties. They get along just fine. You know, this idea that you have to have strong government I mean, you know, we had a strong government in uh, that then gave us a Brexit referendum. Uh, you know, I mean, this idea that, that, that governments, you know, that Tony Blair took us to war against Iraq. The, the, this idea that it's single party government is superior. I'm sorry, you know, I just don't buy it. Excuse me, I never said a thing about a government being strong. I said the government would be accountable. Mm -hmm. And that's the essential difference between single party and coalitions. Yep, in the back corner. Yeah, I mean, on this issue, 
what you have with a coalition is that you elect your representatives mm -hmm. and then they've got to sort it out yeah. between them. They've got to sort out the government if there isn't a clear majority. Mm -hmm. But I have to say that actually that in local government, coalitions and are quite common, even though we have a, sig uh, a, a first past post, post system. Yeah. I mean, this Laxter City Council yeah. is has a long history of that. Mm. I don't think we've had the time I've lived here. Mm. I think we've been. I think there's a short period where we had uh, had had one, one party, party rule, but a lot of it we've had multi-party rule. Even every party rule, every party was represented in the cabinet. Yeah. So it can happen. Yeah. But um, but I think the alternative that we've got at the moment is that actually what the closed doors are behind the closed doors of the Tory party or the Labour party. Because to get to power, you need to take over one of those parties. Mm -hmm. So and so we we think, oh, we're, ele we're electing, we're voting for Tories or Labour. And probably most people don't necessarily look sufficiently at what the current Labour Party or the Tory Party are doing. Mm. It's just, you know, I mean, I used to get this on the doorstep about Council the Greens of we vote Labour here, love. Mm -hmm. we, we got that a lot in Bowen, perhaps less, this is 20 years ago. And, and, you know, perhaps that's less now. But, you know, people have a tradition of supporting the party. Yeah. And they do that regardless of the fact that the party is now completely different yeah. to how it was, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Because <clears throat> and so the debates aren't public between different parties that represent different people's interests. They're within these two major blocks who are themselves coalitions yeah, absolutely. Yeah. of interest. Yeah. But it's, you know, it's like we can't get involved in that, you know, from the app. Side, you know, I'm not a member of the Labour Party. It's not for me to tell the Labour Party how to sort itself out. But you know, that's sort of critical, really. So I just think it's a more open system. So with the, when we had the coalition government between the Tories and the Lib Dems, they had a public coalition agreement. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think that's a much more open and accountable way of doing it. I know you said. I don't really quite agree with your idea of responsibility and accountability because I don't think it actually works like that very well. Wow. Because when it comes to it, we don't get to sit and vote everybody. It's not a referendum where we say we want Labour or we want Tory. Mm. It's 600 local elections, mm. as you said. Mm. So there isn't, that doesn't provide sufficient accountability for people to get out of government that they don't like. Yeah. Your point about local councils is a good one, uh, but it, it remains the case that uh, that uh, most councils are not like Lancaster. Well, <laughs> in Scotland, uh, Labour Party local councillors really opposed the imposition of STV because they knew it would mean the end of their one-party rule in places like Glasgow. And whereas uh, out of the, 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 of all the local authorities, there used to be, you know, Labour would control some conservatives, the others. Uh, an SNP, the other one. Uh, there's now not a single council in Scotland in which there's a majority for one party. No, not a single council. And that, you know, even in, in Glasgow, which used to be a Labour basket. You know. So it reflects but, how people vote. Yeah, but, but yeah, yeah, yeah. But, it's, but it might lead to to the, the problems that I outlined before. Uh, uh, you know, the other thing about, I just like to pick up on people being, quote, Labour people, you know. The, the, the proportion of the electorate which is like that is declining and has been declining for a long time. You know, fewer and fewer people say, I've always voted Labour, my father voted Labour, you know, or Tory or whatever. Uh, more and more people are actually making their minds up on the basis of what governments do. So I'm just curious, obviously a lot of these questions are pro PR directed at David. If anyone wants to make any points or ask any questions that might be almost anti PR? <laughs> Don't be there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tell me about why Can you speak up please? Sorry. Um so it's just around I wanted a bit more clarification with the third pack a third pack per system. So we all know that um, councils and members of parliament deal with local, national and regional issues and they work on short, medium and long term goals. 
with the third path the poor system, with that accountability, we switch from the we switch parties um, usually through the election through that accountability process. So how does the system work to ensure that them long term goals are looked at? Well, I mean, I don't think the system's got anything to do with that. I mean, that's to do with the kind of people who become politicians, isn't it? I mean, rather than the electoral system. I mean, whether councillors stick to their goals or not, it's really nothing I don't think anything to do with how they're elected, Sorry. if I understand you properly. Uh, so why is it, I'll be clear, we do the elections on a five-year router, usually, unless there's been an election called by the government. Like a general election. General yeah. election. Yeah. So when that happens, usually they can twist and a flip. So them long term goals end up switching. <laughs> so rather than a coalition system, I'm trying to get a bit more yeah. clarity on how that longer term goals occur. Right. I mean, governments and parties react to events. Uh, and then that's that's a simple thing. And so they so they and then sometimes they just have to face reality. And they find that their, their, their uh, dreams and aspirations just ain't going to work, you know. Uh, and but again, I don't think that that's got much to do with the electoral system. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah sorry. Yeah. Uh, in 1951, yeah. the Labour Party received more votes. And the Conservatives won more seats. Yes. In 19, what, February 1974. 74. Yeah, 74. Yeah. The Conservatives won more votes yeah. and the, the Labour Party won more seats. Yeah. What would happen in today's politics if we had a wrong winner election? What would happen to us? We would be, we'd be ungovernable. It, now, just one more. It, it happens a number of times in Canada that the Conservatives or someone beat the Liberals, but the Liberals win more, more seats. seats. And yeah, Hillary Clinton won more votes, more votes yes. and yeah. Trump got elected. Yeah. Obviously, they've got their it's yeah. slightly different system, but yeah. it's still first class, first vote. It seems that wrong winner elections are a real drawback with first past the post. Well, I mean, but if the rules say the winner is the person who gets the most seats, then that's the rules. Uh, so it's not the wrong winner. Uh, and I mean, I, unlike you, I mean, I think most people would just say, oh, well, there we go. Get on with it. But but I, I think, I think maybe, maybe, around yeah, maybe in, the 50s, in the 50s and the 70s, but I think politics has become so divisive yeah. and our nation has become yeah, so yeah. divided yeah. that you think it might have consequences. I do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know. But, so is it right to put ourselves in that position, or should well, we Well, as I say, the rules are the rules. As the rules are currently, that the, 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 the party which gets most seats forms the government. Mm -hmm. It's whoever, you know, can command the majority in the House of Commons. Yeah, but I, I agree know. those are the rules. The rules are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we used to have slavery. That doesn't make it right. The simple fact that the rules say that the party that gets the most seats becomes the government. The fact is, is that all votes should be equal. Votes in Lancaster are the same as in Chatham, in Kent, in Sheffield. It shouldn't be where you live depends on how, how much your vote is worth. And, and, and that, yeah, I know those are the rules. We got to change the rules. And people are getting very fed up about this system. Right? Yeah, yeah. This is the last question I can take because I've got a dog to go home to. <laughs> okay. How does it vote? <laughs> um, you, you made two points about first past the post that you felt particularly favourable. Could you stand up, please? Yeah, sorry. Two, two of the points you made about first past the post were one, that it was um, easy to vote out a party, yeah. that the governments were accountable, yeah. and, uh, and secondly, it was simple. Yeah. So if, if you're. Um, a, a Labour voter in one of a solid Conservative seat yes. at the next election, and you want to vote out the Labour, uh, want to vote out the Tories, yeah. and but you, that's always going to be a Tory seat. How are you personally going to help vote out the Tory? You aren't. So it's <laughs> it's not simple for that individual to feel that their vote is actually going to yeah. vote out the, the government and contribute towards that. And secondly, the simple argument really does, I think, falls down when, you, when it comes to tactical voting. Because mm -hmm. you might say, well, that person who is a, a Labour a Labour mm -hmm. voter in the Conservative seat then has to vote tactically. But then that's guesswork. 
yeah. we don't really know where that goes. Mm. Um, and it's unpredictable. It gives us a, an election that uh, can be highly unpredictable. I think there are two major flaws. Mm. Uh, to, to fairly well put, but the good point. I mean, the when 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 votes change in elections, as you know, they tend they tend to change uh, uniformly over the country as a whole. Yeah, so that even in uh, a safe uh, was a safe conservative seat you were talking about, if there was a movement against the government, you know, a strong swing, you would see that in in that seat. And the same kind of swing would happen across different constituencies. And of course, in enough constituencies, it would tip over uh, to, to swing the constituency to Labour. But, but I mean, your point is entirely right. And it was made earlier that, uh, you know, there are many, many seats which are never going to change. You know, uh, I mean, I, I lived, in, I lived in Lancaster now, but before, when I was in Scotland, I was in the seat that was never going to change. And it didn't matter what I voted. But I always voted, you know, and people still will uh, vote. But, but the point you're making is a good one, I've got to say that. There's one other thing I wanted to come back on. Uh, people go on and on about the, you know, wasted votes and wasted votes and people giving up voting. The plain fact is that all the, 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 S, what do you call it, the PR systems introduced in the, this country have not increased turnout. Turnout in local elections in Scotland in the last elections was worse than it's ever been since 1974. It doesn't increase turnout. London turnout is terrible. Uh, so the idea that folk are kind of walking about saying, oh, please let my vote count and then I'll turn up is just mistaken. It, doesn't, it hasn't worked. Although, to tell the truth, the point that you made about that was a good one too. You say, well, it'll take time for people to mm -hmm. learn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 25 years. As David has to go home, should we maybe just do your last summing up and, uh, for two minutes and I'll do summing up and uh, we can keep talking? Well, well, I've kind of said everything I want to say, really, to tell the truth. I think people have kind of, they either disagree or, or agree, but hardly anybody agrees, but they, they disagree, but I've made my point uh, uh, and you might go away and think about it. Yeah, okay, we'll my, my last point is this, is that we're not going to change the voting system by campaigning for change. We have to learn from the suffragettes, from the civil rights struggle in the United States. It's not just going to wake up one morning and Keir Stammer is going to see the light, or Richie Sunak, like, I've got it all wrong. We have to, in fact, get involved in politics, get out there, as we're trying to do, right in the middle of these strikes, Passing our leaflets, talking to people. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, before you go, then, we don't give